Hey there guys, just wanted to start off quickly by saying a big thank you to everyone who has subscribed recently. Uh, now way past 500 subscribers, which is absolutely amazing. Didn't ever think I'd get to that stage when I started the channel, so thank you very much for that. And also thank you to everyone who leaves likes on the videos and also comments. Uh, in particular Derek, who often leaves very supportive comments, and also to Amber, who recently left a really interesting comment on my podcast episode, which you should definitely check out if you haven't already. So in my last lecture, what we looked at was some of the principles of equity, and this time we're going to try and give it some practical application by looking at trusts. So this is only meant to be a very sort of um, starter introduction to trusts, i.e. what is a trust and what are some of the different types of trusts. Hopefully as we go through the rest of the year and I get a chance to put more videos out, there'll be more detailed lectures, but I hope that this is a decent starting point for you. All right, let's get started. So let's start with some of the rather basic questions then. Well, what is a trust? Essentially, it allows more than one person to own property at any given time. And as long as you remember this throughout your course, that the essential aim of a trust is to allow for this um, multiplicity of ownership between more than one person, then you're going to go a long way. In particular, the different types of people who own the property are split into a legal relationship known as trustees and beneficiaries and this is the particular aim of trust law that we're going to examine. So it's a trustee who actually owns the property but they own the property for the benefit of other people, in other words the beneficiaries. Now there's a number of reasons why trusts exist and these go back centuries. One of the original ideas was that Franciscan monks took a vow of poverty and so they weren't allowed to own property in any sense. And therefore if people wanted to donate property to the Franciscan monks, then it would have to be another person who actually owned that property and they would therefore provide for the Franciscan, Franciscan monks so that they could live a decent life and could support their churches. Another idea coming to the picture at the bottom of the slide there is the Crusades that took place in the 12th century. Now at this time a number of English knights went over to fight this religious war in the Middle East and in doing so they had to leave their farms and their homesteads behind but this raised the question about who was going to look after the farms when they went abroad to the middle east and so the trust relationship was set up so that even though the knights continued to legally own the land another person would take the property on and effectively act in a sort of managerial role deciding which fields would be ploughed and which fields would remain fallow, etc. All of those normal decisions that would be taken by the knight. So that's the importance of, of having more than one person able to own a piece of property. Um, and so what exactly consists of trust? Well, to look at this, we can go to Lord Brown Wilkinson, who gave a famous judgment in Westdeutsche Landes Bank Geira Zentrale and Islington London Borough Council from 1996 and he essentially identifies four key elements. So the trust has to be equitable, so this comes back to the lecture that we went through last time where we talked about acting with conscience and acting in a way that was beneficial to all people. Um, these equitable rights act in personam, so they act against a particular person that they have to act conscientiously. Secondly, we have to um, give beneficial, beneficial rights in property to the beneficiary. Thirdly, there's an imposition of duties or obligations on the trustee. So again, we're coming back to this idea of a relationship between trustees and beneficiaries. And fourthly, this relationship that exists between the two is a fiduciary relationship. And we'll look a little bit later about what that exactly means. So there's three different types of trust. Um, there's actually more than three, but there's three main types. And this is what we're going to look at in this particular lecture. Express trust, resulting trust and constructive trust. So let's start with express trust because this is probably the most common. And we've got a diagram here, which at first glance looks a little bit complicated, but hopefully we'll be able to explain it. So we start off with the settler on the left hand side, and this is the person who ultimately owns the property in the first instance and decides to create the trust. 
So when the settler creates the trust, we're splitting up ownership, coming back to that core idea at the start of having more than one owner, and we're splitting it between the legal title that goes to the trustee at the top of the slide and the beneficiary who gets the equitable interest at the bottom of the slide. And we've already talked a little bit about how the trustee and the beneficiary don't live completely separately from each other. There is that relationship that exists between these two owners and we talked about that being a fiduciary relationship. So we've got three key people here, the settler, the trustee and the beneficiary. So let's spend a little bit of time going through those three roles. Now the settler starts with the absolute title to the property. So at this point at the left side of the diagram, the ownership of the property isn't split at this stage and the legal title and the beneficial title all exist within one person. Once the trust is set up, the settler doesn't usually then have any subsequent role to play. So it is possible that the settler could then afterwards be a trustee or a beneficiary or possibly even both. But the reality of the situation in most trust relationships is that the settler then disappears once the trust is actually established. The trustee has the legal title vested in them. That's pretty clear from the diagram and their duties and obligations are set out in the trust document. And we have a number of different types of trust documents. If you think there's a, if you imagine in the sense that there's three different types of trust, express, resulting and constructive, um, within an express trust, there's sort of these different flavors that exist. And so we have a bare trust where there is a single beneficiary and they ultimately have the beneficial interest in that property. A fixed trust is where there's maybe more than one beneficiary that's slightly more complicated and requires an agreement between the beneficiaries as to what is going to happen. Uh, and then finally, we have a sort of very complicated version, which is a discretionary trust. So rather than the property just simply being held for the benefit of one in a bear trust or more than one person in a fixed trust, here we have the trustee taking an active relationship with the beneficiaries and having to make some managerial decisions. So, for example, um, a parent might set up a trust for their children and the trustee might have to make a decision as to which child has behaved best throughout the year and that child will then get the um, relevant money um, from the trust fund for that particular year. And so we have a discretion existing within the trust relationship or within the trust document that requires the discretion to be exercised as to which child actually did behave better. Now that's obviously a very basic and a facetious example, but you can see how a discretionary trust involves the trustee a lot more than a bear trust would, where the trustee is just acting as sort of like a caretaker for a particular amount of money, say. So we've talked about this relationship between the trustees and the beneficiaries and now seems like a good time to actually talk about what a fiduciary relationship is. And the courts have really been very broad on it. It's not really very well defined. It's kind of one of those things where the more you've seen a fiduciary relationship, the easier it is for you to identify one. But it's essentially based on a relationship of loyalty and good faith and it's a legal relationship that exists between people. So you can imagine something like a solicitor and a client, that relationship would be described as a fiduciary relationship. Uh, similarly, between a doctor and a patient, that would be a fiduciary relationship as well. I think it's important to say, as I've put on the slide here, that this relationship is dependent on the role that the other person is actually performing. So while in a doctor-patient relationship, that is fiduciary in, t in the sense of it being related to the health of the patient, but if the doctor was giving fashion advice or giving directions to the patient as to how to get to the shops, then that's clearly outside of the fiduciary relationship. It's no longer to do with the health of the patient. Um, it's outside of that. So if fiduciary relationship is dependent on the sort of social role that the people are playing at that particular time as well. So the beneficiary is the final person in our tale. Um, this beneficiary has an equitable interest in the property. 
and the rights are dependent on the type of trust of trust in question. So if we talk about a bare trust or a fixed trust, then we can see that there are perhaps vested rights in the beneficiary. In other words, the um, beneficiary has a clear right to the property. However, in a discretionary trust, there can be contingent rights on the beneficiary. So if we go back to the example of the parent setting up the trust for the most well-behaved child, then the rights of the beneficiary are obviously contingent on them behaving the best throughout the year and therefore being entitled to the certain amount of money set aside for that. Finally, before we move on, it's important to look at the case of Saunders and Vautier. Um, this was a case where an absolutely entitled beneficiary, so a person who is perhaps um, a beneficiary under a, a bear trust, um, we're talking here about a single beneficiary who is sui juris, which means of age and of mental and legal capacity. If they decide to, they can direct the trustee to deliver up the trust property. So that person would then become the absolute owner in terms of the legal title and the beneficial title as well. So um, a trust relationship could be dissolved or broken up in that way if the beneficiary or the beneficiaries decide that that's what they want to do. So one person could in theory have all three roles. I just wanted to mention this quickly so that people are aware of it. So a settler who perhaps has a certain amount of money, uh, maybe they're a parent and they want to set up a trust for their family, then they could have um, that themselves and perhaps their husband as the trustees for a particular amount of money that they have. And they could have the beneficiaries as being the entire family. So the mother, the father and however many children there are. So you could potentially have a relationship where a person is the settler and then they become a trustee and also a beneficiary. Now, obviously, that's very unusual and doesn't really happen very often. And we're more likely going to be dealing with situations where there is a distinct settler, beneficiary and trustee. And so I think it's important that if you're answering questions on this, uh, whether that's a problem question or an essay question, then you get used to thinking of people within the context of their legal role. So rather than thinking about Adam or Bertrand or Charlie, think about their role as either a settler, a trustee or a beneficiary, because once you understand what their legal role is, it's then much easier to identify what their um, duties are, what their obligations are and what rights they potentially have as well. So that's dealt with express trusts and we're going to now come on to resulting trusts. These can be implied by the courts in two particular situations. Um, if it's not made clear who the beneficiary is going to be, so going back to that diagram, we had the uh, arrow going along the bottom of the screen from the settler to the beneficiary. If it's not clear who the beneficiary is, then that arrow effectively flips round and it would revert back to the settler. So the settler would then become the beneficiary. And that would be a resulting trust because the benefit results back to the settler. Secondly, if a, per a person's contributed to the purchase price of a house, so say that there is a house that costs £100,000 and you have contributed £25,000 towards the cost of that house, then you would be entitled to a 25% share under a resulting trust, which is relatively straightforward. And finally, we have constructive trusts, which I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but they're essentially imposed by the courts where a person has acted unconscionably. To give you a very quick example, if you imagine that you're paid, say, a thousand pounds a month by your company, and for some um, administrative error, they instead pay you ten thousand pounds, then as soon as you realise that this is a mistake that has been made, Unfortunately, you are then a trustee and you have an obligation to go to the company and say you have overpaid me by £9,000 and you have the obligation to return that money. So we can see how the trust relationship can be used by the courts um, in a way to sort of deal with unusual situations like that. Why do people use trust? Well, probably one of the most common examples is the use of wills. 
So here the settler is the person who's died. So once the um, trust um, becomes activated, they're definitely no longer involved because they are dead. And so we have the trustees who exact, uh, act as the executors of the estate and they make sure that the dead person's money and property gets divided up as the dead person wanted it to. And so we can see how that trust relationship can exist to ensure that um, the deceased's will is um, enacted as they would want it to happen. Secondly, in business, if we have business relationships between two companies and they are maybe sort of not used to working with each other or they sort of have um, qualms about that business relationship, a trust is a useful way of creating, well, I guess, trust in the normal sense of the word. So we can often see a trust relationship within that commercial context too. And finally, I've had to put it at the bottom of the page because while it's very unfortunate, it is also very true that trusts are often used for tax avoidance. So you often hear in the news about tax havens. You might have heard about people like Jimmy Carr who have had all of their money stored offshore so that they don't really have to pay as much tax. And the aim of this is obviously so that they don't they pay as little tax as possible. But they use trust relationships to do that so that they can be domiciled or live in the UK, but they would pay tax as if they lived in, say, the Cayman Islands and the Cayman Islands then wouldn't have a very high tax rate. And trusts are essentially the mechanism to do that. So you often see a lot of young people wanting to go into trusts law just so that they can um, make a lot of money by helping out the rich to avoid tax, which isn't really a very good thing, but it exists and that's the way it is. So um, it's, it's, it's an abusive process, but there you have it. So trusts still seem perhaps a little bit alien. We can think of them in the context of wills and that gives a practical element to it. Um, but I did want to talk about how trusts are often used in popular culture as well. Um, so it's often used in sort of 18th and 19th century literature. So we have in the top left, we have Pride and Prejudice, Colin Firth, obviously, in his role from the BBC drama series. And in this particular story, we have an old trust relationship um, on the basis where if a male relative, such as um, Eliza Bennett's father, died, then all of the property would revert to the next male relative. And so you see a situation where the young women have to find a man um, who is, uh, let's say, wealthy so that they don't fall into poverty when their father dies. And that's sort of the basis for a lot of um, literature at the time, in particular Jane Austen's literature. Um, you could also look at the um, novel Persuasion if you wanted an example of that. Top Right is probably one of the most famous novels involving equity and trusts. I did talk about it in the last lecture about Bleak House and the Courts of Chancery. Again, we have the possibility of a woman, Esther Summerson, being left destitute. And so we have a, a sort of role there. And looking back a little bit further in time, we have Samuel Richardson's Pamela, um, which was all about a woman who was abused by a man, um, assaulted by him. And then she eventually decides that she should marry him so that she can get his money. Um, and she's seen as a hero for basically marrying this person who was horrible to her and assaulted her, um, which was obviously ridiculous. And so Henry Fielding wrote the novel Shamala, which is basically a parody of it. And he flipped the trust relationship around so that this time you had a woman who was basically trying to trick a man into marrying her so that she could get all of his money. And so we can see how while the trust relationship has normally in the past been used to um, do down the role of women within the home and within the family, um, we actually have a situation here from Henry Fielding that points out that women could actually benefit from it. But I think it is important to know from the historical context that women often did lose out in these trust relationships. And uh, we can even look at sort of the um, pictures of Hogarth, um, a famous painter from the time, to see examples of that. And there we have all the basics from trusts right through to settlers, trustees and beneficiaries, as well as a look at some of the different types of trusts as well. Apologies for wittering on towards the end. Um, I'm basically a completely massive Jane Austen fangirl. 
and you won't know this but I actually normally record all of my videos with the camera set up on a massive pile of Jane Austen novels um, so apologies for that but we got there in the end didn't we um, thanks again to everyone who's been liking and subscribing to the channel recently if you do have any other questions or comments that you'd like to make then do leave those in the box below and I'll definitely try and get back to you thanks very much for watching bye